if I'm gonna hire an agent, if they're not a hell yes, they're a hell no. And then even you see those people that are hell yeses, and you're like, you came to me wanting to be here, wanting this coaching, wanting this accountability. What have you implemented that we've been working on? And it's so frustrating. Welcome back to the Light It Up podcast. If you're new to this channel and you wanna know everything about making money in real estate, selling sales skills, building your business or investing, then subscribe below, tap the bell for notifications so you can be the first to know what makes our great guests so successful. Yep, and we get calls and texts from people just like you every single day and we absolutely love it. So whether you're new in the business or looking to grow, feel free to reach out, happy to help. All right, today we have Brianne Green. Brianne, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Hell yeah. We initially heard about you from uh, obviously an MFO and uh, our buddy Chase Ames was just like, you have to have Brienne. You have to have her. I think that more than just Chase, there were some other people too who, who had told me to chase Brienne. So I chased Brienne. I, I DM'd a, her. I said, pun. you have to be on the show. And then um, she, what, you had somebody else checking your DMs. Our DMs were lost. No, I had a, a baby. And so you I had a baby too, the DM for a little bit while I yeah. had somebody else checking him. And Good then excuse. I was catching back up. And I was like, wait, wait a second. I missed them. <laughs> she replied, she's like, this is from five months ago. But if you would still like to have me, I would uh, like to be on the show. Awesome. So here we are. Awesome. Yes. Well, you have a good valid excuse. Why do you take all the lightning round cards? Let's hear. We'll split them up. Awesome. Before we go into this. Oh, Brianne, please tell us who Brianne Green is. That's how Kira uh, wants me to do the intro. Hmm. All right. So we'll do it the way Kira wants you to. <laughs> I'm Brianne Green. I am from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I have been selling real estate since I was 18 in 2006 full time. So this is going on year 18 for me. And I run a, I guess, mid-sized team here in Oklahoma City. We've got 19 agents that work for us. So we started doing some team building back in 2021. So we have an awesome team, a great business, and here in a great city. Great. Right. That's insane. I didn't realize there was 19 agents. Good for you. Yeah, we've grown a lot in the last two years. And, and I, I was just telling Kiro as we were preparing for this interview, I was like, not only that, but they actually prospect, prospect, at least according to Instagram. I've seen the videos. I've seen the reels. I've seen you panning around the office. I even saw them prospecting recently on a Saturday, which is awesome. Yes. So yes. Uh, obviously we see a lot of team leaders do that and, and you know, prospecting themselves or prospecting on the weekends, putting in the extra right. the reps. But uh, to see more than, you know, a few agents on your team doing that, that was awesome. Yeah. So we'll jump into that a little bit more in a few minutes. But. We'll start with the lightning round. And Kirill, you go first. All right. What one accomplishment are you most proud of? Ooh, that's a that's a hard one to pick one. I would say I'm torn between two of those. I mean, I would say I'm most proud of one starting my business in high school and what I grew it to be, um, to my kids, you know, being, I was a single mom for a while and growing a business and a team and balancing those things. I would say those are my two accomplishments that I'm most proud of between my business and my kids. I love that. That's awesome. Did you guys hear what she said? Starting her business in high school. That reminds me of Ava. That's awesome. <laughs> That's, That's my daughter. Joy. Oh, look at that. You have a daughter named Ava? <laughs> that's ironic. I do. That's great. There's a girl on our team that's, uh, her name is Ava, and she's had her license since 18. however old you're out, you're able to get it, 18, and yep. she's been hustling ever since. I think so. she made 96 grand in her first 12 months in the industry, and uh, she John helped her with her first flip at 19. That's so, fantastic. Yeah, she's been stressed out about it ever since. <laughs> I was like, we got to do like 10 of these a year. And she's like, ah, this might be my last one for a bit. <laughs> All right. What's the hardest decision you've ever had to make? Hardest decision I've had to make was to become a single mom. Okay. That's the decision. Yeah. Ending a marriage and chapter of life um, was a very hard decision, but it, it propelled me forward in incredible ways. Yeah. And my memory might be completely wrong and I might watch this. 
I don't remember if you ever said this on stage. You said you helped, you, you were raising the girl, your, your kids, and then you helped someone get through medical school. Was that, was that right? Yes. So <laughs> my first husband, yes, I got married when I was 19 and put him through medical school. And then <laughs> the time he was graduating and our daughter was born, the marriage had become less than ideal. I like the best way to say that. And, yeah. you know, it was just making the decision that it was best to not continue that. Yeah. That's strong. All right. Who had the most influence on you growing up? I would say that it's kind of a combination of my dad and grandpa and Mike Ferry. I grew up with Mike Ferry because my dad and grandfather started going when I was two. Yeah. Um, but dad and grandfather are the reason I'm doing what I'm doing. And so the exposure that they gave me and just mentorship and leadership is 100% why I am where I am today. That's awesome. Who would you say taught you what? I would say my dad showed me you sell real estate in really high volume. Like that that was the only option. So I didn't know there was an option to sell real estate not in high volume. And I, you know, saw just that blind faith of, you know, you get on the phones, you prospect, you go on appointments, like that's just what you do. And my grandfather really worked with me on the skills and things. He would have me in the summertime role playing with agents in the office. So I knew all of the scripts and things. And then I would say just growing up, we didn't listen to anything other than Mike Ferry cassettes in the <laughs> car. And so it was just from a very young age, just like learning that mindset and that grit and that skill that came from Mike, which I saw then represented my dad and grandpa all the time. So you know, it was like when you grow up in that environment, you're just yeah. brainwashed to become successful. <laughs> I love that. It's like today's day and age. It's like, hello, Barbie. And you're like, sign the contract, please. Sign the contract, please. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. All right. You want to take this one? Yeah. What's your most commonly used emoji? <laughs> that was one here. Um, the laughing face with tears. <laughs> it's on its side. Yeah, see, the fun part of that question is having people describe it. Okay, all right. It's not yeah. necessarily the actual emoji. Sorry, my bad. All right. I have to laugh and have fun with life, so <laughs> that's my favorite. See? What are you most worried about with the next generation? I'm most worried about their addiction to technology and, like, how if you take away the tablet, it's like you've crushed their souls. So, yeah, I'm seeing that there is very much a component of teaching communication and socialization that I didn't feel like we had to be taught. Like we have to teach our kids. So I would say I'm really concerned about that side of it and just um, guiding them through all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a valid, a valid concern for sure. Especially after you just taught us that you grew up role playing <laughs> or told us that you had grown up role playing yeah. and that, you know, just to see kids like even my, my niece and nephew who I don't think use the iPad, like, iPad nearly as much as like a lot Makes of them socially kids. awkward more than yeah. anything else. Yeah. Yeah. But that's Addicted to screen time. Yeah. So 100%. walk us through a couple of things. So how the hell do you get your agents to prospect? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a work in progress. We just make it very clear that when we interview people that we are a prospecting team and, you know, part of, me building a team was realizing what need there was out there in the real estate world and how agents needed training and structure and guidance. And it was one of those things where it was like, I was so gifted in what I was raised in. And then I knew I had built a real estate business doing, you know, 200 plus deals a year yeah. through prospecting. I mean, when I started, there were no like services to give you expired numbers for sale. By, like I literally had a white page phone book and that's how I started calling. And I grew a business through prospecting. So I knew it worked. And it was one of those things I was like, I know I have a system that if agents will buy in a hundred percent, I can get every single person on my team earning six figures. And that is where I'm very particular about who we bring onto the team. I don't just want bodies here. I want people here that are wanting to be coachable, want to grow, want to create a better life for themselves yeah. and their families and their kids. And part of that is getting them to understand that importance of prospecting. 
And, you know, obviously agents grab onto that at different levels and different speeds, but it's whenever they start to buy in and they can get past that initial, you know, first couple of months on the phone where you're not seeing a ton of results, then they start to see the results. That's when they buy in a hundred percent. You know, we had one of our girls here, she's 25 years old. She's been in the business a year and yesterday she went and pre-ordered her Audi. And so she went with one of our other agents and she videoed her like signing the papers and she texted me and she's like, this is a hundred percent because I prospect every single day. And so it's when you start to get them to connect that and go prospecting, I love the results. Yeah. That's how you create a team that prospects. Yeah. That's awesome. And a culture too, that involves everybody else. It sounds like they, somebody brought their, their coworker with them. They get a new car. It's pretty exciting too. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. awesome. It's, it's, um, I mean, you sort of answered my my next question already. You said that it was somebody who had just gotten their license a year ago, right? Correct. So would you say the majority... Everybody on our team is newer licensees yeah. at this point. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, this this question comes up a lot of times when we're interviewing or sitting down with team leaders because, you know, when you're building this team, uh, a lot of people would agree that, you know, when you're trying to bring on agents that have been in the business for years, it's hard to, you know, teach an old dog new tricks. So a lot of people have, like yourself, uh, have had more success bringing on newer agents. So tell us about some of the people that are on your team. Obviously, they're newer, but do they have a sales background? You know, have they been, like, did they start out for the first three, six months at another real estate team and it just wasn't clicking? They didn't have the right leadership? Talk to us about, you know, where some of these people came from. Yeah. So now, John, we kind of have a combination of people. Our top producer, um, he did have a sales background in Windows. And he got licensed in, see, what would that have been? August of 2021. And his first year, full year in the business with us, he did um, 70 sales. And this year he'll hit 100. And he's by far our top agent. He's killer. He's so coachable, though. That's the thing. Like, if I tell him to do something, he is so coachable. He implements it immediately and doesn't question it. Chloe, who I was just speaking about, is is our second top producer. She's 25, almost 26 years old. And she came to us, got licensed February of last year. She closed 55 deals last year. She's, she's on track to do 70 this year. And we have Angela, who is on her heels. She came to us in November. And as a newly single mom, she has two small kids. And um, she's going to do 40 deals this year. We have um, Jordana, who's behind her. She came out of the nursing industry. She started with us in October, and she's going to do about 45 deals this year. And then we've now got several other agents that have come to us from other teams that had a little bit of success um, on the lines of COVID and realized how what worked then doesn't work now. And they really needed the structure and the training, and they didn't have that. And so we're really starting to see that demand grow because people are seeing what our agents are doing and they're wanting to come to us now and go, okay, we need to learn the skills and things to actually cultivate a business, not just let it fall into our laps. And so we now have five or six agents, if I'm thinking about it correctly, that have done that, that have joined our team. You know, Mikhail did six sales in his first 45 days with us. Nice. Justin's done, I think, eight sales in his first 45 days with us. So we have several that have done that and are transitioning just kind of a base sales knowledge into our system and taking off really, really quickly. And that's so fun to be a part of. Yeah, that's yeah. insane. When you compare what they're doing now with what you have to do when you get started, what are some of the biggest differences? I would say the biggest thing I'm seeing with our agents kind of difference of what they're going through versus we're going, I went through, you know, they're getting leads thrown at them right and left. And so a lot of the agents that are coming to us are coming to us off of the COVID frenzy, if you will. And so business was just falling into their laps. Agents didn't need skills to succeed. They didn't need grit. They didn't need resilience. When I started, you know, the, mortgage industry was crashing. You know, I started the end of 2006 and, you know, you had every single seller you were meeting with for the most part was losing money, bringing money to the table, maybe breaking even in good situations. You had to have just a grit and a sales skills and commitment to the industry that forced you to get better and better to stay in it. 
Yeah. And we're getting back to that now. But if you guys think about the market we've been in, agents have been able to get in and be successful and haven't had to have much skills or ability or grit resilience to do that. And the slightest little market change has now been making agents fall out of the business right and left because they don't have the skills, they don't have systems, they don't have any of that that we had to have. Yeah. It's interesting because it's we went through that whole and it's because when you witness so many people producing from like social media and it's like stuff like that and it's like, well, they're just new in the business and they're producing a lot from social media. That's that's interesting. And then it's like, right. Like the, those kind of things, you're like, all right, well, maybe we should dabble a little bit in that sector. But it's there's people who do it at a high level. Uh, I give them props all day. But then it's like, if it doesn't be, it's not consistent. It's not predictable. It's not measurable. Like what we were taught is like your activities on a daily basis consistently done over a period of time. That was it called the repetitious boredom. No. Um, it's that you can have, there's metrics there that you can scale and measure over a period of time. Right. I'm curious from your, exactly. from your perspective in 20, in 2008, you were what, 20 years old at the time? Right. Yes. Can you walk us through, like paint us a picture of what that looked like being 20 years old in the market crash, working in real estate? I mean, real estate and work was my life at that point. I mean, that was basically what I did seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day. I mean, I was on the phones, you know, prospecting from 745 to noon every single day. I didn't have appointments. I was in the field door knocking, you know, trying to meet the expireds or the for sale by owners that I couldn't reach on the phone. I was out, you know, uh, listing property at a very high level. You had obviously listings sitting on the market a lot longer than you do now. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, it was just hard freaking work. And I was working on my skills all the stinking time. And what I found was just that, you know, I had to create a community. That was the great thing about Mike Ferry of other agents that were in it every single day. Yeah. And, you know, and at times you felt like you were on an island by yourself here working that hard every day. You know, am I the only one this is happening to? And then you pick up the phone and call one of your other friends in another state and they're like, oh no, I'm having the same thing. And, you know, you could really pick yourselves up. And that was really what I saw creating this team is I wanted that community of people that they could lean on each other going through the same things and encourage each other and keep this really positive environment that we get and learned through Mike Ferry. And so yeah. um, it was, it was hard freaking work. I didn't have much life outside of work at that time. Yeah. What happened when you were 21? Now you, I'm assuming you had 21 year old friends as well. And you're like, all right, they're, they they want to go out and drink and do this and the other. And you're like, mm. I will say in the first, I mean, it was, I couldn't tell you exactly, but the first number of years I was in the business, I really did not have much of a social life and friend group. I mean, I, you know, stayed here in Oklahoma and continued on selling real estate. My friends all went to other states and went to college. I mean, we would connect when they came back, but you found there became a divide really quick between mm -hmm. us because I was married. I was building a business. I had total different focus and mindset on things than my friends did. And, you know, that's where, you know, you learn the more successful you become, many times your friends do change. And that's one of the parts of success in the journey that can be hard because it can be a lonely path. And um, so, yes, I still have some of those friends. I just chose that that was not the life I was going to live. That didn't match my goals. Yeah. And so most of my friends, if you look at, are 10 plus years older than me because that was who I more closely matched. Yeah. And that was the group of people I spent a lot more time with. Yeah. Can you share a story of a time where you first realized that was a thing when this, the friends are going to separate? It maybe was the year I was 21 and it was New Year's Eve. And all these people were talking about their plans and what they were going out to do. And, you know, a whole group of people wanted to go out and have like a New Year's party and watch the ball drop and then do all these things. And I was just like going through my mind going, well, I've got to be on the phones prospecting all the New Year's expires tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Like I can't be out this late and partying and doing all of these things that doesn't match my goals. And I stayed home. I didn't go. And that was when it really, really clicked. The price I was willing to pay for success and the differences that were there. I just didn't have any desire to go out and do that because it was giving up what I wanted most for what sounded really fun right then. Mm. And I just wasn't willing to do it. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I feel like the older you get, I just turned 40 and you know, if you go out drinking, it's, it's not a lot of times just a couple hours that you're hungover. It's like that whole next day is gone. Yeah. 
exactly. So, and and as you get older and as you get more successful and more responsible, like it's not that you just, you know, blew off a few hours of prospecting. It's like like when you lose a whole day, it's you know, it's a lot. It's it uh, is. And and sometimes I need more than a day to recover. So that's just my <laughs> own problem, but I was secretly making fun of you in my own mind. I was like, yeah, he needs like four days to recover. <laughs> it's coming from the guy who has to go to bed at eight o'clock. Whatever, man, don't judge me. Uh, <laughs> so it good. I was just going to say, you know, one of the, the common struggles, especially because in 20, 2021, you started building a team. So you went from being a yeah. high producing single agent. Now you're developing a team. How was that transition for you? I have loved the transition. It has been a different transition and a lot of ways, a harder transition than I ever anticipated it to be. Um, you have, I mean, as an agent, I know so much as far as the knowledge of selling properties and you have to learn to be a leader that can pick the right people that want that knowledge, but you have to learn how to impart that and teach that and cultivate and grow that in people and grow a company. And so it has been, Bernie Gallerani told me when I started this, he's like, Brian, this will be one of the hardest things that you ever do in your life. And he was 100% correct. But it is also one of the absolute most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. And so it's been a really fun but hard journey. And I have some awesome people along the ride with me. That's awesome. How do you deal with situations where, you know, I mean, you were you were listing in your prime. How many homes a year? So 2020 was my highest personal production year. And I did 210 transactions that Damn. year. And I would have to go back and look at the numbers exactly. I listed 180 or 190 properties that year. Yeah, so 180, 190 homes. I mean, it's 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 very rare that somebody's going to, you know, even do half of that. So how do you deal with situations where you're pouring into people on your team, explaining to them almost everything they need to do? How do you deal with the frustration when they either don't do it or they don't do it the same way or they're just not following through with with what they're supposed to do? Well, I would say you have to kind of look at that question in two different ways. The frustration of when they're not doing it versus them not doing it at the same level. You know, I would say my frustration is so much higher when people aren't doing the daily steps that it takes that they've committed to do. And, you know, Bernie told me, he's like, Brian, you have to remember there's only a very small percentage of people that sell real estate at the level that we do. And even for us, it was the progressive realization of more and more of what was capable and opening up our minds to the next level and moving through that. And so I realized that part of the question is I just have to consistently help them see how much they're capable of, what is out there, and how continuing to grow and expand their thinking and their life, how that connects to them doing more because it keeps the complacency component out of it because yeah. it doesn't take but so many deals for people to start to become complacent. So you have to do that side of it to get them to start to see what's possible and how much they, how big they can become. But then it's, it's the not them not wanting to do it and connecting to it. That is where as a leader, I had to really learn how to channel that positively and not negatively because it just blew my mind. It would frustrate the heck out of me going, I'm literally opening up the playbook of how I built my business, what I've done day on, day out. Why would I lie about this? I mean, yeah. all I have to do is positively build you up. I'm not going to say or do anything that's going to hurt you. So why won't you buy in? And I'm having to learn that that's people's own limiting beliefs that is stopping that. They don't have that open mind to everything that's possible where I came into this industry, like I had blinders on, like I knew nothing other than what Mike Perry had taught. I'd seen it work. I didn't know anything else. So I just knew you prospected every day and you did this system and you role played and you learned your scripts and you listed property at a high level. Then now we've got agents who see all these other options and are following all these shining trinkets. And I'm like, commit to what is going to be the foundation of your business and get really, really great at that. Yeah. Then there's all these other things, social media and, you know, all these other things we can add into it, but then add those in to build on the foundation you've already built. And I think that they want to jump once they've started seeing a little success too quick to, okay, now I'm just going to do it on social media. Yeah. Okay. Don't replace your prospecting with that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, that's, that's so solid. 
I get what John's saying. It's because John's very analytical. So he's trying to track exactly what he's worth per hour. So when he goes in and he's like, I'm going to spend time with this agent to teach them something and they don't implement it right away, he loses his shit very fast. Well, <laughs> no, he's just like, I give it, up. And I can hear the frustration too in, in, Brienne's, challenge, yeah. in Brienne's voice. It, it, it's like you said, why would I try to teach you anything that's not going to help you? But it, you know, time after time, you're, you're literally pouring it. Like you said, there was a guy on your team who's super coachable. He'll just literally, you know, take your direction, doesn't question anything. I mean, but not everybody's like that. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, I think it was, John, I want to say it was you that had said in one of your podcasts, if I'm going to hire an agent, if they're not a hell yes, they're a hell no. Right. And then even you see those people that are hell yeses and you're like, you came to me wanting to be here, wanting this coaching, wanting this accountability. What have you implemented that we've been working on? Yeah. And it's so frustrating Yeah. because you're just like, I'm trying to help you get better and achieve the goals you set, not me, you. And that's frustrating. Yeah. I can't want it more than you do. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes it feels that way. Yeah. Yeah, it does. We, um, I had the privilege of shadowing Bernie earlier this year. I don't remember when it was, maybe in March. And when we were walking through, he was introducing everybody. But before he'd introduce them, he'd be like, this girl over here, she's amazing. She just bought her first house. And it was like based off of the accomplishments each person was able to get. Do you feel like the similar accomplishments of the team is like, you, you feel like it's your own as well? Oh, yeah. You just feel this pride when you see what they're doing. You get so invested in their vision. And that is huge as, you know, in the beginning onboarding that we do with all of our agents, I walk them through and help them personally set goals for themselves. And I like them to set, you know, short range and long range goals to really create this vision for the life that they want. Yeah. And so, yeah, when they send me those messages and you know, they're checking it off of like, hey, you know, I just did this or I just did that. I keep that. And I like, I love that. That helps keep me encouraged and going and seeing how these people are changing their lives. Yeah. And it's one of those things that's like, we've been given so much, you know, through the training that we've had and the businesses that we've built. And, you know, it's like to who much is given, much is required. And so it's getting to pour that into these people and see them change their lives, change their kids' lives. That's amazing. Like that's the yeah. most fun part of honestly being a team leader. I just love it. Yeah. I guess that's when you have good people. I think in Oklahoma, there are a lot of really good people there. <laughs> it just sounds like they're a lot more friendly. <laughs> not going to be mean. <laughs> Higher conversion rates and everything over, over there too. Um, and yeah. I know I was snooping on one of the uh, the posts you had in the, in the past. As you were panning through some of the rooms, there was like certain agents would have like a goal tracker. It'd say like goals that I want for like this month. And it'll be like, the guy had four and he's like checking off three. Um, how does the accountability part work? As far as what we provide as a team leader? Yeah. So, I mean, we have minimum standards that you have to be achieving within 90 days of joining our team to be a part of our team. And um, so, I mean, our minimum standard is two deals a month. And I mean, in Oklahoma, we have a lower to average sales price. And so I'm not creating a culture for a team where they're barely getting by. I want them to be able to live a great life. And if you're not doing two deals a month, you're not going to be able to have that, you know, with our sales price here. And my commitment is that every single person on my team is earning six figures. Like that is my commitment to get every single person to that level and higher. And then I have individual coaching with each of our agents each week, but we're going over their personal goals and where they are. And every single week, they set an accountability with me of, between now and our next call, I'm going to accomplish X. And then we hold them accountable to that and look at why or why not they, what got in the way? Like, why did you do it? Why didn't you do it? How do we repeat that? Or if it was negative, how do we break that habit? So we're looking at that, you know, every week on our coaching together. And then every day when I'm in the prospecting space with them, like, hey, what's going on? How can I help? What do you need help with to yeah. really watch that accountability? That's awesome. The one thing that I wanted to segue for briefly is, we, we were always talking about how we're taught to have our blinders on, just hunt for the next deal, hunt for the next deal, but then also not, well, just regulatory of it, not investing for the future and not planning ahead. What are you planning to do now that you've set you know this up? What are you planning on doing for the future investing or are you already doing that? So we're already doing that. My husband and I own um, a lot of single and multifamily properties. And nice. so that's his huge passion. And so he's doing that and, We've done a couple of flips, but we really do a lot of find them under market value, fix them up, uh, refinance our money out of it and rent them out and let them continue to grow. 
And so over the last several years, I think we we're up to 58 doors. I Good think for is you. Where we are now. Um, so we're really, really building that aggressively. And um, then, I mean, I, I don't see myself leaving, being, uh, growing my team anytime soon. I'm only 34 years old. So I got a, got a long time. I've got a lot to give, a lot to pour in still. Yeah. Um, so I, I really see that, but we're absolutely building for the future. Love that. What are some things that you'd want to leave with the younger audiences, especially like the, the female audience that's younger that wants to get into real estate or too scared to get out of that shell? You are the only one holding yourself back. And that is something that I had the gift of. I was quite a bit older until I really realized how unique what I was doing was. And so I just had such blind faith and just my parents and everyone around me had just created in me this mindset of I could do anything that I wanted to do. And I could be a fantastic mom and wife and I could still have an incredible business. And, you know, to do those, I didn't have to sacrifice anything. And so it's just commit and believe. And I would say as well, surround yourself with really great people doing what I'm doing and being so focused on my goals. I can't do everything. And so everything that I don't love and doesn't match my goals, I have delegated to somebody else. And then I would also say, just don't think too small if you're young or if you're a woman. I would say, you know, the lie I see a lot of young people believe is I have so much time to do this. Just always want to turn that. I'm like, but do you? I mean, what if you could have built up an incredible life for yourself by the time you're 30, 35, you can be so much further ahead in life. Don't think too small because there's, you know, if you used to think like a million dollars was a ton of money, then you get a million dollars and you're like, well, I can't retire on that. You know, what's next? You know, yeah. so you really start to continue to get that. And so as a young person, it's like the quicker you can surround yourself with big thinkers, see what's really possible, fully buy in and commit, the more successful you're going to be. That was great. That. And great. just side question, what, when you were younger going through it, because I, my biggest insecurity was not having graduated college and I felt inferior to others when I was at presentations. Did you have a similar insecurity or did you have a different kind of thing that limited you? You know, as far as that, that never crossed my mind. Um, people actually never questioned my age, believe it or not. I mean, I bought in 100% to Mike and, you know, I'd pull my hair up and I would wear a suit and I was confident and I never got questioned. I get questioned now more on my age when people ask me how long I've been in the business, which is ironic. <laughs> you say 18 um, years. So, <laughs> yes, and they're like, how old were you? Um, so, but I would say more of where my insecurity came in was two areas. One, getting into the higher price points. I kept myself in a lower price point. And then two, I would say I really saw it come in and just like I saw I could do the deals. It took me a while to open up my mind to the higher income. So there was a couple of years where like my deals went up, but my income still stayed the same. Because I saw myself being so young, I was like, oh, this is still a really great income. And I didn't see myself as a higher income earner. So complacency would set in really quick. Yeah. And one year, Mike challenged me about that at the Superstar Retreat. He pulled me behind stage so was, um, and was talking with me because so it's going to be on stage that year. And he like nailed me between the eyes about it. And he was like, what if you went back and fully committed how much money could you earn? Because I was on track again that third year to do the same. Mm. And between August 1st and January 1st, I earned $200,000. Well, I'd earned $250,000 like the previous couple years. And it was just like a whole other level because I realized I was the one holding myself back. And I had to remove that complacency. I had to remove those own, those limits that I put on myself being young and being like, oh, I just couldn't earn that much money. I could. Yeah. Awesome. No, that's that's powerful. Well, this is an absolute pleasure. If someone wants to reach out to you, give referrals, what's the best way to do so? Um, so you can find me on social media, Brian Green or Homes by Brian team. Um, we're on all platforms. You can um, email me at Brian at homes by And um, we'd love love to connect, love for referrals. I really, really appreciate you guys having me on here today. That was Work. a pleasure. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it.